Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. When I was young, my mother's favorite song was a country and western tune called I Always Love the Rain. I have to admit it's a catchy song and parts of it still ring through my mind today. But I've always hated the rain. It washed out baseball games and picnics when I was young. It made driving a pain when I got older. And it's the reason I'm not living blissfully unaware of my ex-wife's infidelity. The thunderstorm caught me by surprise about half an hour after I left for my weekly Saturday golf game. I'm not very good at golf, but I enjoy the exercise. My wife, Donna, used to come with me. But she decided about a year ago that she had better things to do on Saturday mornings. When I turned around and drove home, I found out what or rather who that better thing was. The startled Donna and her boss, Simon, were in a semi-clothed, fully loving embrace on the couch when I walked in the front door. The duo probably is lucky I left my golf bag in the trunk of my car, or I might have beaten them to death where they sat. I was sorely tempted. The pair struggled to get their shirts back on as I stood wide-eyed and open-mouthed at the door. When she finally was clothed, Donna stood with her hands on her hips. Don't you have anything to say? She asked. I shook my head and stepped out from in front of the door, which I had failed to close. Just two words, get out, I said. Simon moved as quickly as he could while Donna stood looking at the floor. You too, I said. I'll bag your shit and put it in the garage. I'll call your cell phone this week and leave a message about when you can pick it up. My wife looked up with tears in her eyes. Can't we talk? She said. I'm sorry. Honey, I don't have anywhere to go. You can go wherever he goes, I said. Because I'm calling his wife as soon as I get a second to dial the phone. I kept my composure during the ten minutes I allowed her to pack some personal belongings. But I was tearful when I called Simon's house. Mrs. Elliot, I said when she answered. This is Rick Sears. I know this is inconvenient for you, but I think we need to have lunch this afternoon. There are some things we need to discuss. I heard her sigh deeply. My husband and your wife, she said sadly. I can't believe it. I found your number on his cell phone records for the last six months. He said it was work-related calls, but there were far too many for me to really accept that. But I wanted to believe him. I'll call you back. He just pulled in the driveway. It was almost an hour before Irene Elliott called me back. I spent the time alternating between rage and despair. Donna had been the only person I've ever loved as much as I love myself. I guess that wasn't enough. When Irene called, she sounded as miserable as I felt. Screw them, I said. They deserve each other. That earned a slight laugh. I'd like to get together for lunch tomorrow so we can share records, Irene told me. I plan to meet with a lawyer first thing Monday morning and have the papers delivered to the son of bitch at his office that afternoon. I added a laugh. I've already opened my templates to file the paperwork, I said. I'll bring some copies of things I give to my clients. I hate divorces. I think I'm going to hate this one even more. When Irene Elliott walked into the restaurant for lunch, my eyes bulged out of their sockets. She was eight months pregnant if she was a day. I felt my anger rise with each step she took closer toward me. When she sat down, it bubbled over. It is a little known fact that the offending party in a divorce can be made to pay for the non-offending party's legal fees, I said. I brought a list of lawyers who will help you out for little or nothing. But I think I'll get another list of the nastiest ball-busting attorneys I know of. That filthy son of a bitch. Irene smiled serenely. I'm sorry. My soon-to-be ex-wife is just as much of a son of bitch. Daughter of a bitch, Irene corrected me with a smile. My emotions are all over the place anyway. Now this. Half of the time I want to castrate him, and the other half I'm so sad I can hardly move. I nodded. I should have beaten them both to death with a golf club, I said, and I was surprised that I meant it. I shook my head quickly to clear the image from my head. Wow, Irene replied. That would have solved my problem, but you would have had a whole new set. At least as it is, we can help each other. I pulled a sheaf of papers from my briefcase. I opened Donna's email account last night, I said. Here is chapter and verse of their affair. I haven't read any of these yet because I still have to see her one more time to let her pick up some stuff from the house and I'm afraid of what I might do. I'd like to be there, Irene said quickly. You come to my house while Simon is there. I'll come to yours while Donna is there. I smiled. It sounds like a perfectly diabolical plan, I said. Now, I want to give you some free legal advice. Obviously, I can't represent you. Something about ethics and conflicts of interest. I don't know. I slept through that week of law school. Before you go to the lawyers on Monday, 
go to the bank. Leave $500 in your checking account and remove the rest. Irene smiled. Already done, she said. I transferred every last penny from there last night. I sat back. First things first, I replied. How did you manage that? Internet banking, she said. I nodded and wondered if I had that set up. Donna had taken care of the household expenses. Let's have a quick lunch, and I'll check to see if you have the program on your computer, Irene offered. I smiled. I could do basic word entry, but I was as about as computer illiterate as a person in this day and age could be. Now, you need to put some money back in the account, I said, and I watched Irene's eyes flash in anger. He me out before you shoot the messenger, I said. Leaving him a little bit to get by on will score big points with the judge. After all, you're the aggrieved party, and you're being magnanimous. If you take everything, they'll see vindictive. Good, she spat. I want them to see vindictive. I feel vindictive. I left him his life. Anything else the son of bitch gets is a bonus. I like this woman's spirit. I'm just telling you how a court will view it, I said. You're free to do whatever you want. Irene sighed again. I am absolutely not free to do whatever I want, she said. I'm going to have a baby any damn day now. And my husband was screwing your wife instead of painting the nursery. The paint fumes make me nauseated. I'll make you a deal, I said. You check out my computer this afternoon. I'll paint your nursery tomorrow afternoon. I'm taking a week off from work. Irene smiled and patted her tummy. Deal, she said. But if we don't eat soon, you're going to have one unhappy hungry woman on your hands instead of just one unhappy woman. After a lunch in which Irene ate most of the appetizer, all of her entree and a portion of mine, we headed back to my house where Irene went digging onto the computer. She quickly found the money management program and made an electronic transfer from checking to savings. What the hell? I heard from the room set aside for an office as I got us both a bottle of water. I worried that the baby was on the way and hustled back in. Just as with the day before, I stopped with my mouth open in the doorway. There in living color on the computer screen was Irene's husband screwing my wife. They made videos, she hissed. Dozens of them. Irene was scrambling to find a CD to burn the incriminating evidence when my cell phone rang. Rick? My wife said when I answered. I handed the phone to Irene. Have anything you'd like to say to Donna? I asked. Indeed, she did. Irene started to go into a tirade about the videos but she saw me shaking my head violently. I mouthed the word surprise and she got an evil glint in her eye. You're a pretty low life bitch, she said instead. I'm a week away from having a baby and you're screwing my husband. Well, you can have him. When Rick and I are done packing all of Simon's shit at my house, we're heading to his to pack yours. We'll set it out at the curb for you two degenerates to come and pick up one day this week. I smiled. I don't know, Irene said to an unheard question. I talked to him yesterday and told him my situation. He came over today to do all the things for me and the baby that the scum sucker you're screwing was supposed to do. You should have just come to me. I would have traded you even up. You can have the piece of shit you got and I'll take the gym you didn't want. Irene smiled and I shook my head embarrassed. I'll ask, Irene said into the receiver as she got another evil grin on her face. Donna says there are some work things she needs off the computer, she told me while barely containing her laughter. She wants to know if she can stop by and get them. I bit the inside of my cheek to keep from laughing out loud. I changed the alarm code before her, but hit the car seat, I lied. Tell her she can have the whole machine. I'll set it outside when I leave for work Wednesday morning. Tell her she can pick it up any time after 7 a.m. It'll be on the porch. Irene nodded her approval. That would give us a while to hunt through the rest of the files. Oh, and ask her to tell Simon hello for me, I said. I talked to a few of my old clients last night and they're planning to say hi to him for me too. It was Irene's turn to bite the inside of her lip. Oh really? She said. Um, I figured the two of you couldn't wait to set up housekeeping. I mean, it's not like it's a secret anymore. Simon's not with her, she said as she rolled her eyes. She said it was a one-time thing and she hasn't seen him since he ran out yesterday. I chuckled. It was really gallant of him to stay and protect her, I said. He left like his, but was on one fire. Of course, after what he did to you, Irene, that can't be much of a surprise. Irene's eyes lost their fire and became suddenly sad. Actually, it was a surprise, she said as much to herself as to me. Well, I hope you and Simon decide to continue your one-time thing. From what I can see, you two deserve each other.
Irene hung up the phone and jumped back on the computer to try to quell her emotions. I took a moment to follow through on changing the alarm code in case Donna decided a preemptive strike. Irene and I drove to Staples where we bought a new computer system for each of us and an external hard drive to dump all the files on. Irene was a computer whiz and managed to download my whole hard drive. By the time she was finished, it was almost 10 p.m. It was raining again when I drove her home. We need to be careful, she said as I pulled into her driveway. I agreed wholeheartedly, but I couldn't understand the importance of it just right now. They've proven rather adept at lying, she continued. I wouldn't put it past them to have someone watching our houses now that they know we've been together. Suddenly, it all became clear. They're not the bad guys, I said. We are. I've had clients who have wanted to go that route, but I always declined. I try not to be too sleazy. Irene laughed. A non-sleazy lawyer, she said. I never thought I'd see the day. I'm still coming over tomorrow to paint the baby's room. And if you want, I'll be right there with you when the time comes. Irene's eyes filled with tears. Thanks, she said quietly. Let's just get through tomorrow. I helped her out of the car and walked her to the door. Should I come in to check to make sure things are all right? I asked. Would you? She said. I didn't want to seem like a wuss. Everything was all right in her house. She had already changed the alarm code, and I patted her shoulder as I was leaving. I'm hitting the bank in the courthouse tomorrow. Do you want to file the paperwork together? Irene shook her head. I've still got to find a lawyer, she said. It might be a few days before I get to the filing. But I will go to the bank to make sure everything is above board and let them know that Simon has no access to our accounts. I can't represent you, but I can advise you. I can put together a packet for you to file pro SE in the morning if you want. But you don't have to file at all. You know that, right? I mean, you have a child with him. Irene looked thoughtful. Do you read minds? She said. I tilted my head to make sure I heard her correctly. Uh, no, I mean, I barely have a mind of my own. The smile returned to her face. I want to file as soon as possible, she said. But I know how difficult it can be to get an appointment with a decent attorney. If you can put together some paperwork, I'd appreciate it. I'll meet you at the courthouse at lunch. I went to the car to get my briefcase and handed a copy of the papers I planned to file in the morning. If you get the chance, look through these. It has a legal separation date and I pretty much asked for two-thirds of everything as primary wage earner of a short-term marriage. I don't know your financial situation, but I can't imagine Simon makes enough as a high school guidance counselor to afford a house this nice. Irene snorted. No, I'm the primary wage earner, she said. I do computer programming and networking. I make about 10 times what he does. A smile came to my face. Maybe that's why he was slumming with my wife, I said. He wanted to get back in touch with the proletariat. Did you see those videos? She said. It looked like they got in touch with a lot of things. Will you say we drop a copy off at the school board meeting after we take them to the cleaners? We didn't stop at the school board Monday morning, but I did find an old adversary and approached him. What the hell do you want? Detective Lieutenant Jason Mangrove hissed when I entered his office. My alimony is up to date and I haven't talked to the bitch in a year. I know I said calmly. I'm here on another matter, a personal matter. Lieutenant Mangrove didn't move. I would like to leave a potential piece of evidence with you. I said with my eyes cast downward. I hope you'll give me a receipt confirming acceptance and sign this chain of custody form. Mangrove pushed forward on his chair. Criminal or civil case, he said. I knew he didn't like me, deservedly so, but I also knew he was a good cop. Civil, I said. If it were criminal, I would have given it to anyone in uniform. I just need you to hold on to this until I come for it. I wouldn't have come to you if it weren't important. Mangrove sighed, but he nodded. I handed over the CD, and he sealed it in an evidence bag. He pulled a patrolman inside who witnessed the chain of custody signature, and I was off. How long will I need to hold this? Mangrove asked as I departed. I shrugged. I hope I can call you in a day or two, and you can toss it. I just need it out of my hands and into someone's who can be trusted. I left before I could hear Mangrove's retort. I had represented his ex-wife in their divorce, and I had mistakenly taken his wife's word as gospel. It was only later that I found out she had misled me and the court. But by then, Mangrove's reputation was almost in the trash. I had done my best to make reparation when I found the truth, but it wasn't enough and I knew it. But I also recognized that his word was beyond reproach in the courtroom. It was among many mistakes I'd made a couple of years before. 
I shook my head as I left to meet Irene at the bank. Irene and I were the first two through the doors of Citizens Bank. It took us less than 20 minutes to open new accounts and leave some cash for our wayward spouses. We smiled to each other when the manager told us someone was trying to access the accounts from another branch and that the people in question were irate that the majority of the money was gone. Should have moved quicker, Irene said with a smirk. He was quick enough to get to Sears' house Saturday morning. An hour after our stop at the bank, we filed our complaint in divorce at the county clerk's office. We paid our $170 filing fee and secured the services of a constable to serve the papers Tuesday since it was the last day of school. It seemed like fitting retribution. After that, we celebrated with a late lunch and a trip to Lowe's to pick out the color for the baby's room. Irene tired easily, and we stopped often for her to rest, so the trip took a little longer than planned. Donna and Simon left several messages on our cell phones, but we deleted them unheard. I'd already heard most of what Donna would say during my time as an attorney. Irene didn't care a whit what Simon had to say. I spent the rest of Monday preparing the room that would house Irene's coming edition for painting and all of Tuesday putting on the first coat of paint. Irene selected a nice sand color for the walls with a pale green for the trim. I joked that the green would match the baby poop almost exactly. She didn't find me amusing. I had forgotten about my promise to Donna about returning the computer on Wednesday morning. Irene had finished with it Monday and had instructed me on how to disassemble the damn thing and pack it away. I opened the door at 6.30 a.m. to put the computer on the porch and came face to face with my wife. I said after 7 a.m., I said. It's not after 7 a.m. Donna looked up at me sadly. You had them serve divorce papers at school, she said. That was awful. I shrugged. I had no address for you, I said. Irene had no address for Simon. It was the best we could do. I went to an attorney after I got served, she told me. I just want you to know that you're wrong. We never committed adultery. It was the first time we met. What you saw was as far as we got. Some kissing, some touching. Nothing more. I was told it doesn't meet the legal definition of adultery. I smiled. So you're saying that you never had sex with Simon? I asked. Donna nodded. Never. She said with vehemence. I shrugged. I'll give you a no-fault divorce in 90 days, she said. I mentally shook my head. In our state, a no-fault divorce meant a 50-50 to -50 split of all assets considered to be marital property. An at-fault divorce, such as one involving adultery or abuse, would result in a judge determining the balance, but would leave the non-offending party with no less than 67%. I'll take it under consideration, I said. I want to come home, she said. I sighed. I've been thinking about that. I think it's a good idea. Donna looked up at me expectantly. I don't want the house, I said. It has nothing but terrible memories for me. You can have it. I'll find an apartment this week and take what I want. If there is anything missing that you want, let me know and I'll consider if you should have it. You can take possession of the marital home at noon Sunday. I can already tell you that something I want will be missing, she said. How in the hell can you know that? I asked heatedly. I might just take my clothes and leave. That's not what I meant, she said quickly. I want to come home with you and you'll be gone. You have no home with me anymore. You can have the house, but there's no way I'll be in it. If you don't want it, you can put it on the market. I've paid three months of the mortgage. It's up to date until September. I'll pay you $1,000 per month in alimony for 24 months. That's one month's alimony for each month we were married. It's the best offer you're going to get. Donna shook her head. If you won't try to work things out, then we'll go to court and I'll take half of your net worth, she said smugly. You might be an attorney, but I know my rights. I was met by Irene at her door. She had a look on her face that bespoke her emotions. You just missed my scumsucker of a soon-to-be ex-husband, she hissed. He wants half. I almost told him about the videos. Lying piece of shit. I should have taken his balls. Idle threats, I said sweetly. Remember what we have. We can hoist them by their own petard. We'll let them state their case under oath and then rip them apart. I still have hope that they'll see reason and accept our offer. Irene and I had spent hours Tuesday evening working over the deals we were willing to offer. Irene wanted to leave them with nothing. I knew it wasn't going to work that way. The courts very rarely left a defendant with nothing. It led to too many courthouse shootings, I always thought. I also suspected that neither of our cheating partners would accept our generosity. Instead, they would want more. 
I had no doubt that Donna's suddenly precarious financial situation was the reason she wanted me to take her back. I need to look for an apartment this afternoon, I said, as soon as I'm done with small fry's room. Can you go through the classifieds for me? It'll keep you away from the smell. Irene smiled and pulled out a paper. It was what I was doing with Shithead showed up, she said. Can you believe he wanted to come home? He asked if we could try counseling. I asked if he would consider castration. I chuckled. Anyway, there is a nice apartment complex about five minutes from here, she said. The paper says they have openings. It has a pool. You should take a look. I shrugged. Anywhere would be fine with me, I said. Once I head back to the office, my hours will be ugly again. Irene frowned. I was the same way, she said. But with, what do you call her, small fry? Coming soon, I'm going to spend less time there. I considered what she said. I have no doubt my hours are what led Donna and Simon together, I said and Irene nodded. But she sure liked the money. Irene nodded more vehemently. You should think about spending less time at work, too. Money isn't everything. It was after midnight on a Friday night when Irene called to tell me she was in labor. I had moved to the apartment complex a few blocks from her house, so I was at her door in less than 10 minutes. We had rehearsed the procedure a dozen times, but it was hectic as hell on the actual night. The 13 days since I first met Irene had been a whirlwind. I had painted the room and put together the furniture. I had bought a video recorder and a digital camera to record images. I had moved to a new apartment and returned to work. I had juggled calls from Donna and threats from her attorney and calmed Irene when she received the same from Simon and his attorney. I had expected most of my activities, but I wasn't prepared for the next portion of my life. Irene grasped my hand tightly and pulled me with her into the delivery room. I was not super pleased about the situation, but I hardly could tell her no. I figured I would stay with her until the real event kicked off then get away as fast as possible. The rain outside should have told me that wouldn't be the case. I kept my back to the action as I maintained a tight hold on Irene's hand and whispered soothing words to her. I graciously declined when the doctor offered me the opportunity to cut the umbilical cord, but I gladly accepted the bloody bundle that was Irene's daughter after the doctor had let Irene hold the little girl for a minute. Eve Elliot was a beautiful baby. I had taken Irene's advice and cut back on my hours, much to the chagrin of the partners of the law firm I worked for. My leisure time wasn't spent exactly leisurely, but it was certainly enjoyable. I became Eve's erstwhile babysitter while her mother worked in her home office. Irene would take a break every couple of hours to breastfeed the little girl, times when I made a hasty retreat, but she seemed content to leave the precious little girl in my care during the evenings. I had wanted children since my marriage, but Donna had steadfastly refused. She wanted to wait three or four more years, much to my disappointment. Irene told me Simon was reticent about having children as well, and he had expressed disappointment then disinterest when she told him she was pregnant. For my part, I would be happy as hell to be considered Uncle Rick by Little Eve. Donna and Simon hadn't given up. Their attorney had filed a counterclaim alleging infidelity on the part of Irene and me. It was ludicrous, but the court had dutifully accepted the filing as required by law. Irene and I had a laugh over that one, but we still were obligated to defend against the claim. Simon had made a few efforts to see his daughter. Irene had primary custody, and Simon hadn't bothered to go to court to secure visitation. For the first couple of months, he would call about once a week to secure Irene's permission to visit. Irene had always asked me to be there whenever Simon came to visit. Donna would call my cell phone a couple of times per week, usually to try to get more money out of me or to ask me questions about turning on the furnace or putting in the storm windows. The first depositions were a joke. Donna's attorney looked as if he was 15 years old and acted as if he were 12. He expected to be able to dictate the pace of the proceedings, and that simply wasn't going to happen. I had engaged a full-fledged ball-busting shark as my attorney. She was a take-no-prisoners type who ate little boys like Donna's attorney for lunch. She had never heard of Donna's attorney, and neither had I. I simply don't see how you can allege adultery, he said before my, but had hit the seat. She was screwing another guy, I said harshly. The boy actually blushed. That is incorrect, the boy said. Allow me to inform you of the legal definition of adultery. I started to speak, but my attorney touched my arm. I'll handle this one, she said. This man handles 40 or 50 divorces a month. Just the thought of his client list gets my silkies a little moist. He understands the legal definition of adultery far better than you do, I can assure you. 
and I can further assure you that he recognizes adultery when he sees it. At my attorney's mention of Silkies, the boy's blush deepened. Remind me to bring my client list to our next lunch meeting, I said wiggling my eyebrows and my attorney punched me on the arm playfully. I saw an opportunity to speak and I took it. Donna, I've been generous, I said. There is no way you'll get a no-fault divorce out of this. You know it and I know it. My first offer was a house and $24,000 in alimony. I've documented every lie you've told me since our separation and I've knocked $10 per month off for each one of them. My final offer, which is good until Monday afternoon, is $480 per month in the house. If this goes to trial, you'll lose the house too if I want it. Donna was shaking her head so hard I thought her necklace might break. I have not lied to you. Not once. I never had sex with Simon before our separation. For 70 per month, I said as I pulled out my notebook and make a tick beside the appropriate lie. Keep going and you'll owe me money. Screw you, Donna hissed. We'll go to court. Before we go, I want to get a couple of things on the record, my attorney said. This is a formal deposition and it will be recorded. You are under oath. For the record, Ms. Wendell, did you have a sexual relationship with Simon Elliott prior to June 3rd? Absolutely not. Donna practically screamed, then she sat back with a smug look on her face. That's really all I have to ask, my attorney said, and I started to rise. I have some questions of your client, Donna's boy wonder said. Did you have a sexual relationship with Irene Elliott prior to June 3rd? He asked with a grin. I knew it was coming, and I was prepared. I have not had a sexual relationship with Irene Elliott prior to nor after June 3rd. In fact, I don't think I ever laid eyes upon her until June 4th. At the time, she was nine months pregnant. She has since given birth, but our relationship is not sexual. Donna's attorney rolled his eyes. We have photos of you leaving her house, he said. We have photos of her leaving your apartment. We know about you too. You certainly seem chummy with a daughter. Are you sure she isn't yours? I was out of my seat before my attorney could stop me. You sniveling little twit, I roared. I'll cut your balls off and stuff them down your throat if I see one camera pointed at me or those two. Mark my words, you little scum sucker, you don't want me as your enemy. Donna, ask your sex buddy what Irene does for a living before you decide to reject the deal. You have until 5 p.m. Monday to come to your senses. Monday afternoon came and went without a word from Donna, but I did hear from Judge Bettina Markle about my outburst. It seems Donna's attorney had filed a formal grievance against me with a presiding judge. I was to be in her chambers at 2 p.m. Tuesday with my attorney. Tuesday morning brought Donna's counteroffer. She wanted me to give her the house and a $50,000 lump sum alimony payment. Neither the summons nor Donna's demands worried me much, but Irene was pissed when she got a similar packet from Simon. It seems that she and I weren't the only two comparing notes. I sat in Judge Markle's chambers and listened to the snot-nosed kid give chapter and verse on my alleged transgressions. He is an officer of the court, he said. He threatened another officer of the court. That's actionable. My attorney smiled sweetly. He was there not as an officer of the court, she replied. He was there as a plaintiff. And if Mr. Hart maintains his sanctimonious attitude, Mr. Sears will not be the last client who speaks harshly to him. If Mr. Hart doesn't grow up, your honor, you're going to have to set aside another judge just for hearing his whining. Judge Markle shook her head gravely. Just what did you say, Mr. Sears? She asked me. I smiled at the woman. I called him a sniveling twit and told him he didn't want me as an enemy, I replied. It was almost word for word what Judge Markle had said to me five years before. The judge burst out laughing. Mr. Hart, she began, being called a twit is not actionable. In fact, if your actions there were anything near your attitude here, I would say Mr. Sears was correct in his assessment. As for the second part, I would say he definitely was correct. He is not a person you want as your enemy. The young attorney got red face and sputtered out a few syllables before regaining composure. Well, he said haughtily, my client was refused by several attorneys in this matter before she came to me. I can understand why. I see the good old boy network has expanded to include women. I will be asking any sitting judge in this county to recuse himself or herself from this matter. Judge Markle's eyes became slits, but I spoke before she could unleash her venom on the man. I'm going to give you a little free advice, I said quickly. If you want to say the things you did when you're talking to your buddies or to your clients, no one will care. 
But if you try that shit in a judge's chambers again, you better have a toothbrush in your pocket, if you get my meaning. He looked dumbfounded, so I assumed he didn't. I started to speak again, but Judge Markle cut me off. Contempt of court, she said brusquely. That means I put you in jail until I decide to let you out. He's right again. You open your mouth to me again, it better be prefaced with your honor or ma'am. And your tone of voice better be respectful, even if you don't mean it. It's time you grow up if you want to play in the big leagues. We don't take kindly to crybabies up here. Now, as for your request, it is out of order. If you put in a formal motion, I'll deny it. The young man sputtered again. The simple fact is that Mr. Sears has already asked us to recuse ourselves from the case, she continued. He was looking out for your client while you were still holding your crying towel. Now get out. Donna had sat quietly throughout, but I noticed her face getting paler as the judge spoke. When we left, she refused to meet my gaze. As for your offer, I said to the top of her head, fat chance. The fall brought a host of activities. I spent three or four evenings a week with Irene and Eve. I learned how to fix a bottle and even to change a diaper. Irene started to take a couple of hours per week away from the small fry, so I got a crash course in unsupervised childcare. It was good for Irene's peace of mind and I had a great time with Eve. I didn't even mind when she was fussy. We'd take a short stroll and I'd sing her a couple of silly songs and she would be out like a light. I couldn't decide what my relationship with Irene was. I was starting to realize what I would like it to be, but she treated me more like a brother than as a significant other. I guess for the most part, one treated her sisterly as well. Still, we would watch a movie or sit and talk after Eve was asleep, and we ate together almost every evening. Whatever relationship we had, we both seemed comfortable around the other, so we kept things low-key. Of course, the thought of some sleazeball photographer outside of our living areas made that easier still. It was early January before the cases of Sears vs. Sears and Elliot vs. Elliot made their way to the docket of family court. Donna had made a vain attempt at contacting me to try to exchange figures again, but I refused. The whole private detective thing had really pissed me off. Simon had stopped coming to visit Eve at all. I think he was worried that Irene was going to hit him up for child support. She was keeping that gun in the holster for right now. Because a judge from another county was being brought in, both cases were scheduled to be heard on the same day. Mine in the morning and Irene's in the afternoon. We really figured the afternoon session would prove superfluous. I thought it a good sign that there wasn't a cloud in the sky when we entered the courthouse. The court listened to Donna's counterclaim and refused it without comment. She had pictures of me leaving the house and Irene leaving my house, but nothing of a sexual nature. Our claim was straightforward. Donna had said during her deposition that she hadn't had a sexual relationship with Simon Elliott. We held our ace in the hole, the videos and emails, hoping we wouldn't need them. But, of course we did. I testified vaguely about evidence that I had found that implicated the pair in adultery long before June 3rd, but I was never asked about it on cross-examination. Donna on direct questioning denied the affair, and did so again under cross. We have a rebuttal witness, my attorney said. The plaintiff calls Detective Lieutenant Jason Mangrove. Because he was offering rebuttal testimony, we didn't have to list Detective Mangrove as a potential witness. Thus, the defense had no opportunity to explore what he might have to say. After he was sworn in and gave his full name and occupation, Detective Mangrove glared at me. What is your relationship to my client? My attorney asked. None, he said harshly. In fact, I dislike him immensely. My attorney nodded. Do I have a professional relationship with him? She asked. Absolutely not, Detective Mangrove replied. He represented my ex-wife in our divorce. He's a scumbag divorce attorney. I work criminal cases. When is the last time you saw Mr. Sears? Objection. Donna's attorney yelled as he rose to his feet. Your Honor, this is all well and good, but would you please instruct counsel to get to the point? The judge looked at my attorney. Your Honor, Detective Mangrove has vital information in his possession with direct bearing on Ms. Wendell's claims, my attorney said. I am establishing that Detective Mangrove has no personal interest in the outcome and putting together a timeline for the court. Oh, I have an interest, Mangrove said. I hope she takes him for all he's worth just like he did to me. The judge reprimanded Detective Mangrove and allowed my attorney to continue. When is the last time you saw Mr. Sears? She asked. The detective consulted a notebook. June 5th of last year, he said. At that time, did he leave anything in your possession? Yes. Could you tell the court what he left with you? 
A compact disc. Do you know what is on the disc? I have no idea. He came to my office and asked me to hold on to it. He had me sign a chain of custody form in front of a witness, and it was sealed in an evidence bag. Did the disc leave your possession since that time? It left my physical possession, but it was locked in my office safe at all times. Does anyone else have the combination to that safe? Detective Mangrove looked thoughtful. I don't think so, he said. My former secretary did, but she retired before Mr. Sears came to visit. I changed the combination after she left, and I haven't had a permanent secretary since. My attorney nodded. Do you have the disc in your possession right now? Detective Mangrove nodded then affirmed his answer verbally as he produced a sealed evidence bag from his jacket. He also produced the chain of custody form, which was stapled to the outside. We offer plaintiff's exhibits one and two in rebuttal to Ms. Wendell's prior testimony. This raised another objection, but was overruled. I saw Donna's face had turned the color of chalk, and I heard her whisper, hurriedly, to her attorney whose face was as red as blood. Your Honor, the contents of this disc are not suitable for public viewing, my attorney stated. The plaintiff asks you to view the contents in camera, and the plaintiff has no further questions for Detective Mangrove. Donna's attorney tried for 15 minutes to get Detective Mangrove to change his story, but it didn't work. I knew the detective had spent hundreds of hours on the witness stand, and he knew how to deal with arrogant attorneys, myself obviously excluded given the size of his alimony payments. The judge ordered a recess while she viewed the disc and told us she would issue his ruling at 11.30 a.m. I saw Irene in the hallway, pacing back and forth with Eve in her sling. I smiled and gave her a thumbs up as I headed toward them. Well, I think this afternoon will be anticlimactic, I said. I'm sorry you won't get the pleasure of seeing Simon's face when he finds out. She smiled and handed the baby over to me. I'll get the pleasure of seeing him coming to grovel, she said. That's just as much fun. I saw Donna and her attorney approaching with Simon and his lawyer in tow, so I turned to face them. I'll take the original offer, Donna said quickly. I still think you're bluffing. But Simon says Irene might have been able to create something on the computer. Create my butt, Irene hissed. Or rather, your butt. Please, why do you think we found a police officer to take custody of it? You're screwed and you know it. And I know it and Rick knows and now the judge knows. You're screwed in a hundred different ways on more than a dozen videos. We've talked and here's our latest offer. Get lost. I patted Irene on the arm and she turned to me quickly. Don't you start, she said. They wanted to play hardball. They lied and cheated and tried to get a hell of a lot more than they deserve. Things are tough in the big leagues, little girl. And you and Dushabag over there bit off a hell of a lot more than you can chew when you decided to screw around on us. You'll get half of whatever the judge decides this bitch gets minus the house. If you don't like it, we'll head in there and play this game again this afternoon. I'm sure running out on a nine months pregnant wife to screw around with some bimbo will really play well in the court transcripts. You should thank Rick for stepping in to help me with Eve. Otherwise, I'd be taking $500 in child support from your meager salary. Simon stood with his mouth agape. I couldn't blame him. I was a little shell-shocked myself by her outburst. Irene was fighting mad, and I for one wasn't about to tangle with her. Simon's attorney seemed to think discretion was the better part of valor. Half of what she gets minus the house? He said, we'll take it. Oh, and Simon Boy here pays my legal fees, she said. Since it's an at-fault divorce, that's his obligation. Simon's attorney nodded, and Irene turned to me. May I assume you're charging me your standard fee for the advice you've given me? She asked with a malicious grin. I've heard rumors that you charge $600 per hour. My attorney tells me that your time is as billable as hers is. I couldn't suppress a chuckle, and I could see Simon doing math in his head. Irene just grasped my arm and led me away from the group. I'm sorry, she said. I shouldn't have made that decision for you. I know you don't want to leave her with nothing, but I think it's what they deserve. Still, it wasn't my place. I patted her arm. It's okay, I said. You're right and I'm wrong. Take a note. It might be the last time you hear that from me. She smiled. Oh, I doubt that, she said. You said the same thing after finishing up Eve's room. The colors looked perfect together and you admitted you were wrong to doubt me. I smiled and nodded. I was ready to continue the conversation when my attorney and Donna's came over. She is willing to settle for $500 per month in alimony for two years, my attorney said with a smile. She keeps the house and she gets one quarter of the joint checking account. I still had little Eve strapped to my chest, but I tried my best to shrug. You two just don't get it, I said. 
An at-fault divorce means she's entitled to no more than one-third of everything. By all rights, I should force her to sell the house and give me two-thirds of the proceeds. She'll be lucky if she doesn't wind up having to sell the house to pay my attorney's fees. Forget alimony. We'll wait for the judge. Donna's attorney turned away and shook his head gravely. Donna looked as if she was going to cry. The judge's ruling was harsher than I expected. Ms. Wendell, I watched the contents of that CD with nothing less than disgust, the woman said. It is apparent to me that you have intentionally misled this court to try to seek increased financial gain. I don't take kindly to that. Mr. Sears made a very generous offer. In fact, he has made several generous offers. You refused each one because you wanted to reach for the brass ring. Well, you missed. The marital assets will be divided thusly, 94% to Mr. Sears, 6% to Ms. Wendell. Mr. Sears was a primary wage earner during the marriage, so alimony is called for. I order Mr. Sears to pay you $5 per month for the next two months. It is my understanding that Mr. Sears has paid you $1,000 per month for the last seven months. I order that returned less $10. Each of you is forbidden from removing the other as primary beneficiary to any insurance policy presently in existence. Ms. Wendell, you may keep the marital home for five years. During that time, you are responsible for all costs associated with the dwelling. The house is to be sold five years hence, and the proceeds split 75% to Mr. Sears and 25% to Ms. Wendell. The house will be appraised within 30 days at Ms. Wendell's expense. The appraisal value will be the starting point for the resale value. Any sale of the property for less than the current appraisal value will come from Ms. Wendell's share. Ms. Wendell, you are further ordered to pay all reasonable legal fees associated with this case. Mr. Sears' attorney will present an itemized list of expenses within 60 days. Court is adjourned. I turned to see Irene sitting with Eve in the last row. She was smiling brightly and jerked her head toward Donna. Donna was in tears and Simon was sitting in the row behind her holding his temples as if his head were going to explode. I couldn't resist as I walked past him. That is one expensive piece, I said to my attorney as we passed. But I made sure I said it loud enough for each of the two defendants to hear. Irene and I celebrated that night by taking our attorneys out to dinner. I was nominal friends with both of them. I had opposed them in court many times and I respected them. Each of us had joked that our client should at least feed us after we had secured a favorable settlement for them, because it would usually be a year or more before we saw the majority of our fees from them. I figure maybe I would start a trend. Irene surprised us all midway through. Let them stew for a day or two, she said. Then call Simon's lawyer and tell him I'll forgive the money he owes me. I won't hit him up for child support if he agrees to stay the hell away from us. I arched my eyebrows at her. What happened to emasculating him? I wondered aloud. We did that, she said. But remember what you've told me. If you take away everything, you leave them with nothing to lose. I tilted my head. So now you listen to my advice, I says I bounced Eve on my knee. One shot deal, my friend, she said with a glint in her eye. I know I can't stop you from giving it, but I don't have to listen to it. I nodded. Do the same with Donna. Tell her I don't want any money from the house either. Irene nodded at me. You were right about something, she said. We made a lot of points by offering a generous settlement when we knew we had them. We gave them every chance to get out with their reputations and their pocketbooks intact. Don't get used to me telling you that too often either, she said. Over the months, I'd watched Irene regain her footing. The trauma of a nasty divorce coupled with raising a child alone had been rough for her. But she had rebounded as time passed. Christmas was tough for her, as it was for me, and her mood had become increasing hostile as the court date approached. It was good to see her smiling again. I figured my time with Irene would decrease since we no longer had a common set of adversaries. Shortly after the divorce, I was proven, right? I still watched Eve a couple of nights per week while Irene went to work out at the Y or for an evening meeting with colleagues. I stopped bringing work home with me and started to spend more evenings at the office. I had less than five months left on my five-year contract with the firm and I had decided to move out on my own in the summer. A few days after the court hearing, Detective Jason Mangrove appeared in my office. She lied, you know, he said without preamble, and I knew he was talking about his ex-wife, not mine. I know, I said. He glared at me. I didn't find out until about a year ago, I said. She really pulled me into her web. I saw the man smile for the first time. She has that way about her, he said. How'd you find out? I sighed. You know, she remarried, right? I said, and he nodded. 
Well, she tried the same shit with her next victim. I did a routine check on him. He was almost 70 years old. There was no way in hell he had abused her. There was no way in hell I abused her either, he said harshly. That didn't stop you. I nodded. Your service record, I said simply. That was the confidential file the judge looked at in chambers. You had three complaints about excessive abuse. Mangrove frowned. I have come to realize that most good cops have at least five or six complaints in their jacket, I said. When I found out the age of her new husband, I told her I would take the case, but she had to pay up front. Let's just say she didn't have the money and offered the barter system. Mangrove laughed. I can only imagine, he said. You should have screwed her and then refused her case. I called my paralegal and under the pretense of getting everything in writing. She didn't seem to know that sex in exchange for legal services was wrong. Or if she knew, she should have been an actress. Hell, maybe she should be anyway. Look at how she played the two of us. She'd be an adult star, he said, and he chuckled. You know, she has a website, right? He asked. Anytime you want, you can see my ex-wife naked for the low fee of $12.99 per month. It was my turn to laugh. Hell, you think that's good, I said. All you had to do was open your safe, and you could have seen my ex-wife screwing. His eyes got big. I wondered what was on that disc, he said. If I would have known, we could have opened a website for her, too. I guess Marcy makes quite a living from pleasing herself on screen. I shook my head sadly, but I could see where Marcy could make some cash that way. She was a fine-looking woman. Why did you pick me? He said. I thought about just tossing the thing in the trash, but I couldn't do it. I just couldn't bring myself to do it in case it was evidence. That's the reason, I said. Even when I was trying to prove that you were the biggest a-hole on the planet, everyone told me that you were a top-notch cop. I knew that you were someone for whom the rule of law was absolute. He looked pleased. I sent a letter, I said as an afterthought because it just occurred to me. As soon as I found out about your ex-wife's deceit, I sent a letter to the police commissioner and your captain. He eyed me carefully. When did you do that? He asked. I don't know February or March of last year, I said. I assume they told you. They didn't say anything about it. But I got promoted to lieutenant in April without even taking the exam. I passed it twice before but got passed over. I figured it was never going to happen. I'm sorry, detective. I really thought she was telling the truth. Of course, I missed my wife screwing around me for almost a year. One thing's for damn sure, he said. If I ever get divorced again, I want you on my side. Irene called my office at 8 p.m. one evening in late March. What in the hell are you doing at work? She asked. What do we talk about? I thought she was joking, so I made a smart comment. I was wrong. You haven't been over for dinner in a week, she said. When you watch, Evie, you bolt as soon as I'm in the door. Did you learn nothing from that wreckage of a marriage? I'm sorry, I said somewhat flustered. I'm just trying to get things tied up here. I only have a couple of weeks to get things wrapped up here. My contract is up in June, and I have seven weeks of unused vacation I'm taking. Good, she said. I officially claim at least a week of your vacation time. I smiled. What do you need painted this time? I said trying to lighten the mood. If anything, I made it worse. Nothing, she said crisply. If you don't want to see us, that's fine, and she hung up on me. I showed up sheepishly two evenings later to watch Eve while Irene hit the Y for her workouts. In truth, I should have been the one going to the gym. My bachelor lifestyle had produced some pretty poor eating habits since I was no longer dining with Irene and Eve every evening. To look at Irene, there would be no way for you to guess she had been pregnant just nine months earlier. She greeted me at the door. I wasn't sure you'd show up, so I made other arrangements, she said. I was a tad bit pissed. When have I ever not shown up? I asked in a louder voice than I intended. When have I told you no when you asked me to watch, Eve? That's not it, Eric, Irene said. I was a bitch the other night. I'm sorry I hung up on you. I shrugged. I made a smart remark and it backfired, I said. The good news is that Eve has a play date this evening, she said. If it works out, I'll host the little girl on Thursday night. This means you can go to the gym with me. I shook my head. I'm finally honing this body, I said. Greasy cheeseburgers, greasy french fries, greasy burritos. It is a work in progress, and I don't want to ruin perfect roundness with exercise. I'll drive, was all she replied. Our schedule became somewhat similar to what it had been during our divorces. 
We went back to having dinner at one another's houses five nights a week. I would watch Eve at least once a week to give Irene some mental health time. Every week after our workout, we'd stop at the grocery store on the way home to restock our pantries, and so Irene could make sure that I had something more than cereal and Pop-Tarts at my house. During my vacation weeks, I would spend the days keeping Eve entertained while Irene worked. As the little girl's first birthday approached, so did the first anniversary of one of the worst days in the adults' lives. Irene was resilient. I expected anger and sadness. It was what I was feeling. But if she was feeling either, it didn't show. My life is better now than it was before, she told me as we split a bottle of wine on June 3rd. I don't miss him. I sat silent for a moment. I don't miss her either, I said. I miss parts of the relationship, but I don't really miss her. Irene patted my hand. We're both better off, she said. As I started my solo practice, I pondered the transformation my relationship with Irene had taken. I still wasn't sure what sort of relationship we had. A couple of times in the past couple of weeks, she had fallen asleep on my shoulder while we watched a movie after Eve was asleep. I kept wondering if the feelings I had toward her were proper. I also wondered if they were reciprocated, but I didn't see any signs that they were. Irene seemed to view me as a safety blanket. I was part brother and part protector, but she had given no indication that she had romantic leanings toward me. My feelings seemed to fluctuate. Irene certainly was an attractive woman. I truly enjoyed watching her on the treadmill, and I almost always made sure I could check out her while she ran. She had a beautiful smile, and she looked as cute as hell when she would tilt her head playfully when she told a joke or make a funny observation. But I also looked at her as a friend. We had spent hours upon hours sitting around sharing our pasts and talking about our goals and dreams. Never in our conversation did a mention of our goals and dreams include the other. Donna and Simon had lived together for a while after the divorce, but then split. The last either of us heard from them, they were engaged, but that was a month or two before. Irene and Eve were waiting outside my new office the day I opened my solo practice. They had been out of town most of the weekend before, so I hadn't seen them in a couple of days. I was in for a shock when I opened the door. The furnishings I had selected hadn't been delivered. Instead, things I had never seen adorned the outer office where my paralegal would be stationed. The story was the same in my office. The functional desk and faux leather chairs I'd picked out at Ikea were nowhere to be seen. Instead, a beautiful walnut desk and real leather chairs were in their place. Surprise, Irene said as I looked around. It's an office warming present, she said as she gave me a hug from Evie and me. I saw the crap you picked out. I couldn't let that happen. I kept my arm around her. It just felt right. Thank you, but you really shouldn't have spent so much. She waved a hand dismissively. It's money, she said. I'll make more. So will you. In fact, I'm here to be your first official client. I eyed her strangely. I want you to prepare a will for me and an order of guardianship for Evie if something should happen to me. I'm going to file for child support from Simon and offer to drop it if he'll sign away his parental rights. Can you draft that for me? I would have done that for you anyway, I said. I didn't relish the thought of her being a client. That would certainly preclude any romance between us if that ever developed. You didn't have to bribe me with office supplies, I joked. How did you get this in here? Joan, she said. Joanne was my paralegal. I should have guessed she was an accomplice. I told the salesman at Ikea to upgrade everything, she said. Joanne gave me her key this weekend. I had to dodge you a couple of times, you scum sucker. I raised my eyebrows. He was at the age where she was starting to pick up words. It's okay if she calls you scum sucker, Irene joked. You can be scum sucker and I'll be bitch. It'll give her practice for when she's a teenager. I shook my head. Let's talk about your will, I said. Simple everything goes in trust Eve. Her guardian will be the trustee. I nodded. It would make things simple. I could finish that in ten minutes. And guardianship? I asked. You? I sat back. Are you sure? I asked. She looked at me as if I were an idiot. Who else? She said. Of course, you know that I can't accept you as a client. She smiled. Good, she said. I was going to fire you soon anyway. Before I had to pay you. But yes, I knew that you couldn't be my attorney. We've been through that before. I shook my head. A week later, we were in the grocery store. I must have appeared pensive because Irene was eyeing carefully. What's on your mind? She asked as we picked out a cantaloupe. 
I pondered whether to tell her what I was thinking. The scene that had played out in my office had really got me to thinking. I was absolutely positive that I wanted to keep Irene an even integral part of my life. In fact, I wanted them to be the central part of my personal life. But at the same time, I worried what would happen to our friendship if something went wrong. Come on, she said. Not with it. I made my decision. Do you think it would make our lives awkward if I asked you on a date? I asked. Irene looked at me and then looked away. Let's talk about it in the car, she said. I nodded. I knew I had pushed things too far. We barely spoke during the remainder of our grocery trek. I didn't know how to take back my question, and I think Irene didn't know how to respond without hurting my feelings. I steeled myself for what was coming when we got in the car. Were you serious about what you asked? She asked when we had put the groceries into the trunk. I looked straight ahead and said sadly, yeah. Of all the reactions I had expected, I didn't expect the one I got. Irene began laughing uproariously. I didn't think the concept was that funny. Just a second, she said as she tried to catch her breath. God, you look so earnest. I stared at her. Before I answer your question, I want to ask a couple of my own, she said. Do we spend more time together or apart? I sat back in the seat. Apart, I replied. How do you figure? Well, with work and sleep. Irene shook her head. Discount work and sleep, she said. When we have free time, are we together more often than we're not? I guess together, I said. Irene nodded. I agree now, when we're together, what do we do? I thought for a way to frame my answer. Well, we talk about our day, I began, but Irene interrupted. We have dinner, we go to the movies or watch TV at home. We sit around and talk. We play with Eve. I nodded. That sounds right, I said. Honest to God, a few months ago, I thought we were dating. I even referred to you at work as my boyfriend. That's why I was so pissed when you disappeared after the divorces were final. I thought you were waiting for all that shit to be finished before we uh, moved our relationship to a physical plane. Then I realized you didn't think of me that way. That's what pissed me off. I went to the gym to get my pre-pregnancy body back and you didn't even look at me. It was frustrating and I took it out on you. I managed to close my mouth. I noticed, I said finally. Irene smirked. I figured that out, she said. Have you noticed the mirrors on the wall at the gym? I watch you watching my body every Tuesday night. I blushed. Have you noticed that my workout outfits have gotten smaller as time has passed? She asked. I nodded stupidly. Want to know the truth? I asked. I thought you might have your eye on one of the guys at the gym. You were dressing to impress. Irene nodded. That's exactly correct. You just were too silly to figure out which guy I was trying to impress. So please go ahead and ask me out. I've changed my mind, I said trying to hide a smile. Irene and I didn't move our relationship to the physical plane right away. There were other things we had to consider, such as her daughter. Eve was 15 months old and toddling around anywhere she could. While I wouldn't necessarily call her a handful, I think the term precocious was invented for her. It took me almost two full days to childproof Irene's house in my apartment. It took Eve about 10 minutes to render my efforts useless. First, she figured out how to remove the covers from the electric outlets. Then she figured out the locking mechanism of the stairway gate. By the time I managed to upgrade those portions, she had managed to get one of the kitchen cabinets open. With each new discovery, she would proudly take one of our hands, or both of our hands, and demonstrate her prowess. Irene would sit and shake her head at some of Eve's antics. But I was convinced the little girl was following me around and emulating my actions. Of course, that idea was put to rest when she opened the cupboard when even I hadn't figured that one out. A playpen proved useless because invariably Evie would escape to wreak her havoc, so we got a playmat instead. It kept her occupied but soon lost its novelty, except for the portions of it that made noise. She never seemed to tire of those. Irene and I would routinely transport the damn thing to the other's abode just to have some relative silence for a while. But each time I would think Eve was about to drive me to distraction, she would do something incredibly cute or loving that I'd forgive all of her past and future sins. She had a way of looking at me with those big doe eyes that rendered me helpless. You would think I'd be used to it. Her mother had the same effect on me. It was almost two weeks after our car discussion when Irene asked me to spend the night with her. Our lives hadn't changed dramatically since we decided that we were officially dating. I realized quickly that what she said made perfect sense. We'd already been dating for more than a year, we just hadn't admitted it to ourselves. Or I guess more aptly, 
I hadn't dared to believe it was true. Irene's body unclothed was more impressive than clothed, not always a given. She had a couple of stretch marks because she was so small, but to me, she was gorgeous. She looked slightly uneasy when she entered her bedroom wearing a short white nightgown, and I'm not sure if the fact I couldn't tear my eyes away from her shapely legs to check out the rest of her helped or hindered. Our kisses started out tentatively. It had been more than a year since either of us had shared physical intimacy, and I know at least for my part, and I suspect from Irene's, that I was worried that I would do something she would find uncomfortable. From the intensity of our lovemaking that evening, I gathered that I didn't. And when she woke me up in the middle of the night for another round, I was pretty sure I did, okay? For me, it was an entirely different experience than I was used to. Irene wasn't passive in the least. She knew where she wanted to go and how to get there. She wasn't aggressive, but she was responsive. Her reaction to my efforts let me know that she enjoyed the things I was doing to her as much as I enjoyed doing them. And things only got better from there. Simon and Donna married just before school started in September. Neither Irene nor I were invited to the wedding. Simon had no problem signing away his parental rights in exchange for a document, absolving him of all past and future child support obligation. In fact, he signed the papers so fast the pen left scorch marks. Irene took it stoically, but I was a little pissed off. I couldn't figure out how anyone could toss aside a child. I agreed to be the guardian of Eve should anything happen to Irene, and I also prepared my will to leave my estate and trust to Eve if the unthinkable happened to me. Our relationship had transcended my wildest dreams. Irene embodied everything I found attractive in a woman. I'm not sure if I changed my view to fit her personality or if we just fit together. I don't know if I matured or if things just fell into place, but it was working so I didn't complain. Irene seemed to be as happy as I was. She was openly affectionate, often holding my hand as we took a walk or brushing my shoulder as she passed by me. I would find an opportunity to pat her behind about every 20 minutes, and I routinely wrapped my arms around her whenever we were alone. It was between Christmas and Thanksgiving when we sat down to have a serious discussion about the future. I think each of us had an idea of what we'd like to have happen, but I think each of us was a bit scared by the prospect. My marriage had lasted less than two years, and Irene's had fallen apart in 18 months. In fact, we'd both been married less than a year when our spouses started cheating on us. Our failure rate at marital bliss was astounding. Still, we both recognized that that was then and this was now. I didn't compare Irene to Donna, and she didn't compare me to Simon. It was during that discussion that I finally hit upon what the major differences between this relationship and any others that I'd been in. Irene thought for a few minutes about my premise and agreed. Our lives were intersecting circles where the other relationships had been concentric circles. Irene and I had many common interests and goals, but we also had a life outside of the other. We each had things the other didn't find necessary to share. For example, Irene wouldn't be caught dead on a golf course and I had little or no use for anything technologically related. The majority of our individual circles overlapped, but there was enough left outside of the intersection to maintain our own identity. I didn't have that with Donna. Irene said she didn't experience that with Simon. Before we were married, if I wanted to do something, he wanted to be there, she said. He wanted our lives to overlap completely. When I started to work, well, you know what happened next? I had to agree. Outside of your husband, whom I didn't know about, Donna didn't have one friend who wasn't my friend first, I said. She learned to play golf not because she wanted to, but because I enjoyed it. Hell, mostly I enjoyed it because it gave me a chance to be alone. She could never accept that it wasn't her I wanted to be away from. It was everyone. Irene nodded in agreement. I like the concept of intersecting circles, she said. I hope she continues to like the concept. Our wedding bands are two independent rings woven together. It only seemed fitting. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.